we have in the Pelion. Okay, please record. That's fine with me. <laughs> Got it. Um, so coming to you from my working room in Saudi Arabia at King Fahd University, um, I'm going to tell the story of some findings that we've published very recently in the journal Stratigraphy. So the agglutinated foraminifera um, are the earliest, they are the earliest group of foraminifera. And we have evidence of agglutinated microfossils, single chambered forms in the late Precambrian. So already in the cap carbonates, there are agglutinated microfossils, which some people believe to be foraminifera. They look like single chambered saccharaminids. And that's exactly what Joseph Cushman believed all the agglutin, all the foraminifera derived from uh, either an allogromid ancestor or a saccharaminid, single chambered form. So monothalamids, as they're called by uh, Jan Pavlovsky, originated in the late Precambrian. There are records of such fossils in the Middle East. I haven't uh, personally found any yet. This is reported from Argent, oh, Uruguay, Uruguay from the latest Precambrian. It's a, a sac shaped foraminifera with a single aperture. Uh, it selects particular mineral grains as many agglutinated foraminifera for, they do. So that's, that's probably the stem group of the, uh, the early foraminifera, single chambered forms. So I'm gonna review the earliest agglutinated foraminifera, all right? The Cambrian or Division Silurian forms are all agglutinated by the way. And we'll talk about the origin of pseudo multi-chambered and multi-chambered foraminifera. And I'll review some new findings we have in the Ordovician and Silurian. So maybe say a few words about some future research. And the uh, earliest tubothalamids, so these are two chambered forms are known from the Cambrian. And uh, they were first described from the Cambrian of Norway. And as you see, they are a simple round proloculus followed by a single undivided tubular chamber. So that's probably the stem group of all the uh, tubothalamids. This is platysolenites. Later, they coil up. They begin to coil. Um, and that's what is known as spirosolenites. It has a proloculus, so two chambers. By the Cambrian, Steve Culver has found, um, so earlier, higher in the Cambrian, um, forms like these. These are amodiscids. Again, it starts with a globular proloculus and a coiled tubular second chamber, which may or may not uncoil. If they're coiled in a single plane, you have amodiscus or rectoamodiscus. If they're, the planes of coiling vary, you have glomospira. If they're coiled about an axis, you have uh, Turritellella. And uh, there are some evidences here that we have a form that is pseudo chambered. I'll explain what that means in a moment. So it looks like the early Cambrian radiation of the foraminifera start from a single chambered ancestor. They acquire a second tubular chamber which may be either straight or coil up, or they become spherical. Um, so we have the, the group of sacamina, samosphera, they become spherical and may later acquire two apertures or more than two apertures. So that is probably the very first step in the evolution of our foraminifera. There has been a report of multi-chambered foraminifera from the Cambrian of Nova Scotia, which was published in uh, 2003 in the Journal of Micropaleontology. But unfortunately, there were problems with the dating of this fauna. I'll go, I'll go back to that. Early Ordovician forms, at least in Europe, where they've been studied, are mostly single chambered forms or two chambered forms. We don't get any multi-chambered forms um, known from the early Ordovician. These are probably two chambered, pseudo chambered forms here, but everything else is a monothalamid. Um, 
In the Baltic area, we have these forms. I know that the Nestales are, have joined in. And this is from Galena Nestel's paper. It's a form with two apertures. Some of them become spindle shaped. They get a proper phyolene aperture. And then later on, these monothalamids may acquire more apertures. And I'll show you that in a moment. Returning to the idea of a Cambrian multi-chambered form. Uh, these microfossils were collected from the Cambrian of Nova Scotia, but from sediment infilling a void. So they are younger. And uh, they were believed to be Cambrian in this study, but they are probably younger. We don't know the age of this fauna. But it is reported in the literature that there are trochaminids, multi-chambered forms in the Cambrian. So that was the paper by uh, the group from Nova Scotia. Mid Ordovician sees the first pseudo chambered forms. And this is the genus Amolagena, or if Maria Rose, Amolagena, if I use the Italian pronunciation, uh, is known from the middle Ordovician. Now, pseudo chambered meaning it has a initial chamber, which then forms a tube, and then connected directly to the end of the tube you can have a second chamber forming, all right? The second chamber does not overlap the first chamber at all. So that's why we call it pseudo chambered. So that's the beginning of some sort of chambering in foraminifera. And remember, amylogena is an attached form, all right? From the Silurian in North America, we know uh, faunas that are mostly comprised or entirely comprised of monothalamids and two bothalamids. So from North America, the Silurian is the genus Amodiscus and Hippocrepinids, which have a globular first chamber and a bent or straight second chamber. And that's about all. Later on, some forms develop multiple apertures. So you have the genus Thuramina and some are colonial. So this, one at the bottom, you see, you see three chambers, but there's no connection between the chambers. There are actually three individuals living side by side. So that could be the beginning of some sort of multi-chambered nests among the foraminifera. All right, now moving on to the Paleozoic of Saudi Arabia. So the Paleozoic outcrops in the north of the kingdom, um, in the area around the town of Kasim. So we've been doing field work up here on and off for the past few years. Um, the sediments are a mixture of sandstones and shales, the shales representing the maximum flooding horizons. And uh, we have studied the three of the major units of the Paleozoic shales. So the age, is the Hanader formation, which is the early part of middle Ordovician, the Ra'an formation, which is late Ordovician, Katian, and the Kusaiba member, which is the oil producing horizon in Saudi Arabia, uh, the Kusaiba shales, which has a Thandovery age, so early Silurian. Um, in mixed in between, there are some glacial sediments because we have a glacial event in Gondwana at, at the end of the Ordovician. But I focused on the three major shale units for this talk. Hanader formation becomes thick in the subsurface. In outcrop, it's not that thick. Um, this is the type of locality. So maybe in outcrop, you have a cliff forming Hanader shale, formation that may be 15 meters thick. And uh, this is uh, a known tourist locality. There are some ancient petroglyphs on a rock down here. Um, so what did we find in the Hanada formation? We have mostly monothalamids, single chambered forms and two chambered forms. However, we do find a few rare, what appear to be ammo, Baculites. So, Amobaculites is multi-chambered. It's coiled. 
you can see chambers here, 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 and then it uncoils. And that has a restricted aperture. So these are from uh, the Hanada formation in the subsurface. Previously, the oldest Amobaculites uh, was reported by Holtsova from the Lower Devonian in the Czech Republic. So the age of this is middle Ordovician. So here's uh, Amobaculites, which is somewhat flattened, compressed laterally. So it probably, probably belongs in the genus Semobaculites, which is laterally compressed. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of these early uh, lituolids. Bulbobaculites is coiled streptospirally in the beginning, so it has an irregular coil, and then it uncoils. You see one, two, three uncoiled chambers in this specimen here. Um, Bulbobaculites was previously reported from the Triassic by David Haig. Uh, that's the oldest known report of it so far. And this form, uh, which I identified as Placopsilina, which is an attached form. It looks like a trochaminid. It looks like trochaminid because it seems to be trochospirally coiled. You see the umbilicus here. And it's coiling around in this direction. But it has an attachment surface. So it grows attached to something. Who knows what? Maybe a, a dead trilobite. Who knows? <laughs> so, but this is quite a finding because uh, the previous oldest report is from the Pennsylvanian of North America of this genus. And finally, we have proper trochamina. So I know that these forms uh, don't look very special. Um, it's my intention to get put them in the micro CT scan and see what they look like. All right. Uh, but you can if you're careful, you can discern chambers. Another crazy form that we have is something that we call Stella because it looks like a little star. I'm not certain if it's monothalamus or, or if it's chambered, but it, it, it seems to be something that picks up rather large quartz grains. And, and just like any agglutinated foraminifera, it uses the, the quartz grains in a specific way. It can orientate them and Stella, orients them such that the pointed ends are sticking out of the periphery. Clever little thing, picking up quartz grains of a particular shape and size, and then using it for, I don't know, protection. Here, the pointy end is, is in the radial direction. So agglutinated foraminifera are known to do such crazy things, pick up particular minerals, orient grains in a particular manner, so I'm sure this is something. Um, and here again is our trochaminid with an attachment surface. And all the flat surfaces of the grains are forming a pavement. So this thing was growing on something. It was growing attached, it's multi-chambered form. And here again, one of these early trochaminids, again, it uses pointed grains sharp grains with pointed terminations that are oriented in a radial direction, okay? Maybe it's protecting itself from trilobites. So that's, the, that's a certain behavior that we noticed among the agglutinated foraminifera from the Hanader, all right? They are picking up grains of a particular size, shape, and using them for a particular function. So a I called it the hedgehog because it has the pointed grains extending radially. The form with the pavement. So it orients the grains so that the flat surface is on the exterior. And so therefore it can grow attached to something. And the only genus of trochaminid which has an attached habitat that is known from the recent is trochaminella of Cushman. So is this a trochaminella or is it something different? And among our trochaminids from the middle Ordovician, we have forms with pointed chambers. 
sort of reminds me of the planktonic foraminifer Leopoldina from the Selly event, all right? A planktonic with radially elongated chambers. Well, surprise, surprise, that form of chamber shape was not invented by the planktonic foraminifera. It was invented by the trochaminids much earlier. So uh, the, the innovation in form is happening here quite early in the evolution of the foraminifera with the uh, finding of some sort of trochaminid genus with radially elongated chambers. So that is an interesting finding. Um, you know, we're in the process of writing that up from the middle or division. Uh, a paper that was published recently is by myself and my former student, Pram Perdana, who I think has said he would join us uh, today for the lecture. And this is the Ra'an formation of uh, the Kasim district. The outcrop is quite close to the campus of Kasim University. And it is the next of the maximum flooding horizons. Dated using chitinozoans as cation, so the middle part of upper Ordovician. And these foraminifera are interesting. Mostly, I have the monothalamids. There are some few tubothalamids, but I have rare specimens of multi-chambered hormocynids. Now the hormocynids, like Rayofax and Hormocina, they are the group of agglutinated foraminifera that are uniserial or predominantly uniserial, and they uh, add their chambers in a in a rectilinear series. They may be curved or straight. And this specimen I identified as subrayofax, which has pseudo chambers. This one has rayofax. Now. That's not a, a, a brand new finding. Uh, the oldest reported rayofax is from Guchik, 1986, from the Mifflin Formation of Indiana. And this is the species rayofax black riverianus from the black riverian, black riverian, which is equal to the lower Mohawkian. So in the standard time scale, it's Sanvian, upper Ordovician. So this is a little bit older than our finding in Saudi Arabia, but our finding confirms that we have multi-chambered hormocynids already in the Ordovician. This until now was the only reported occurrence of Ordovician rayofax. Silurian. So in the Silurian, we have uh, a thick unit of black shale. In outcrop, it's about 30 meters thick. In the subsurface, it's the pre predominant petroleum producer in the Paleozoic. It fuels the, uh, the large oil fields. It's, it's a, it's a well-known source rock. And in outcrop, um, it's been dated using graptolites to the middle part of the early Silurian, Aeronian stage. This is the Kusaiba shale. And in exposure, it's only the upper half is exposed. So, uh, Pram and I sampled the upper half of the formation. We published the results in Stratigraphy, Volume 17, in 2020, and uh, have a surprisingly diverse assemblage of agglutinated foraminifera in the Silurian here. Um, and as we were researching this, we realized that the previously published monograph on Silurian, early Silurian foraminifera was from North America and published in 1968. Nobody has really worked on this material since, at least, you know, not exhaustively. So this is probably the first report of the foraminifera from Gondwana, early Silurian age. And we have what's expected. We have the monothalamids, mostly, tubothalamids, you know, tubular, tubular types, um, the thoraminas with multiple apertures, all right, some coiled or bent tubes, so tolipaminas and so forth. But we have some rare specimens of an amobaculitis. And this, this now is the oldest published species of amobaculitis. 
we called it Amobaculites cusibaensis. And it's definitely multi-chambered, coiled in the beginning. Amobaculites has a plenty spiral initial coil, and then it's uniserial. So this is 40 million years older than what was previously reported from the Czech Republic, uh, the, the range of Amobaculites. And uh, if I can mention uh, the molecular biology, uh, Jan Pavlovsky published this diagram in 2003 uh, in a paper called The Early Evolution or The Evolution of Early Foraminifera. And he dated the origin of the globothalamids, the multi chambered foraminifera, at 350 million years. In other words, Carboniferous. Now we are pushing this back to the early Silurian and maybe even older. So I asked Jan where he got, the, where he got this number from. And he said, well, uh, he took the range out of Loblik and Tappan's book for the oldest Amobaculites. So but this has now uh, been pushed back to the Silurian with our mm -hmm. publication of our paper. So, uh, molecular biology tells us that the ancestors of the multi-chambered foraminifera, of course, are the uh, unilocular forms, the monothalamids, and probably by way of uh, the tubothalamid, amodiscus, perhaps. And then the multi-chambered forms appear and diversify. So let's look at some possible phylogenies, a possible evolutionary trend from a single chambered ancestor to a two chambered form, um, a two chambered form that develops pseudo chambers. So these are swellings of the, the chamber, constrictions and swellings, but the wall is continuous from pseudo chamber to pseudo chamber. That's what I mean by pseudo chambered form. So like this one, Hormocinella, the wall is continuous. It doesn't overlap, yeah? So we know that such forms are found in the middle or division. And I have the subrayophax forms such as these in the upper or division in Saudi Arabia. These forms are known from the Cambrian. That's one possible line of evolution. Another one would be among the two chambered forms. So Glomospira is known from the Cambrian. And if a glomospira acquires constrictions, then it becomes pseudo-chambered. That's the genus Lituotuba. That's known from the late Paleozoic. If it acquires more regular constrictions, it becomes trochaminoides. And these are known from the Mesozoic. All right, these are the pseudo-chambered form. But they're certainly um, evolved from a, a, a tubothalamid ancestor. And now, finally, the multi-chambered forms. And I'm going to throw in something new here. All right, if, if you believe that, that, tro, that uh, trochaminella that we have from the Ordovician was an attached form, it seems to be, because it has an attachment surface, then I'm going to raise the possibility that the evolution of multi-chambered foraminifera started with the attached forms. After all, uh, Amelogena is attached, and that's known from the middle or division. So why not have having an attached form that grows a chamber which connects to the previous chamber? And it grows another chamber that connects to the second chamber. And therefore, it becomes a multi-chambered foraminifera. And then maybe it learns to live freely, all right? It leaves its attachment surface, and then it looks like this. And we have these flattened Amobaculites forms already in the Hanadar formation of Saudi Arabia, and they were probably growing freely, all right? But they have a sort of an attached shape. So I'm gonna throw out this theory and ask everybody to prove me wrong 
um, that the evolution of multi-chambered forms may have taken place among the early attached forms in the Ordovician, which later became free living and turned into Amylobaculites and other coiled forms. So starting with the attached forms. So a few little conclusions from our studies in the Qasim area of Saudi Arabia. We've recovered now uh, relatively diverse assemblages of Ordovician and Silurian hormocynids and Lituolids, and they contain the oldest reported occurrences of some multi-chambered genera. So um, in the Ra'an formation, we have Hormocena, Sabreofax. In Kusaiba, we have Amobaculites, Bulbobaculites. Uh, in, in the Middle Ordovician, Hanadar formation, we have these Plecopsilinas and some crazy trochaminids with elongated chambers. So that sort of bridges the gap between Scott's so-called Cambrian trochaminids and the mid-Devonian multi-chambered forms reported from the Czech Republic. Um, they are not marsh forms, as suggested in the paper by Scott et al. Um, they were living on a dysoxic shelf environment and not anoxic, of course, they wouldn't be there otherwise. Parts of the Kusaiba shale are anoxic, were anoxic. They were, they were, they were barren of fossils. But the uppermost part um, was probably deposited in a dysoxic environment. But still, dysoxic environment means harsh conditions for aminifera have to evolve morphologies to cope with that. Perhaps the elongated chambers uh, is one response. All right, as the Cretaceous planktonics did during the Selly event, they grew elongated chambers, the low coldinas. And uh, and that could be a strategy to, to improve uh, oxygen exchange, as suggested by our friend Cocioni and others who worked with the Cretaceous and Oxic events. Except this is Silurian, and there were no planktonics at that time, only agglutinated benthics. So it would appear that all the innovations that are ascribed later uh, some of these innovations uh, actually appeared quite early in the, in the geological record of the four abonifera. So in 2008, I published this diversity curve uh, for the Phanerozoic, this, the number of genera in each stage. And our new localities are here. And the interesting part of the curve that shows the early radiation of the, four, the agglutinated four abonifera. So, um, so this is um, this was our Phanerozoic diversity curve, and it obviously needs to be updated now because we have additional localities um, with additional genera here in Saudi Arabia. So we're continuing the the work on describing the agglutinated foraminifera from the Paleozoic formations, and uh, we hope to um, establish some sort of biostratigraphy that might possibly be used later by petroleum industry. Although Aramco, Saudi Aramco doesn't use foraminifera in the Paleozoic, they use palynology. But alongside the palynomorphs, we have these assemblages of agglutinated foraminifera, which are surprisingly diverse. They show forms with morphological uh, characteristics that were believed to appear later in the history of the foraminifera. And this is the interesting part because here we have the evolution, the early evolution of the multi-chambered forms, which is not observed in North America. It's not observed in Europe, but it's here in Gondwana on the Southern continent. So I'm going to thank you for that um, and uh, open up the discussion. I'm sure that I'll have people uh, asking questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Really, thank you. I'm always fascinated by the by the the glutenated foraminifera that, in my opinion, are the most difficult foraminifera to study. So, 
mean, it's incredible. It's really incredible. The reason we haven't published the Middle Order Vision record yet is because these are particularly difficult to study. I can understand. <laughs> Looking at the images, I can understand how they can be really difficult, difficult to study. Mm. So I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It's great, great mark. So actually, um, I, I have already seen someone that uh, is willing to ask questions, but there is a question in the chat that arrived before uh, just a couple of minutes ago. And it's from Sandy that says, how can the three living concepts be tested? How can this hypothesis be tested? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, how can it be tested? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you can analyze these agglutinated genera for their RNA, their small subunit RNA, and see if, you know, if how, how when they diverged. Um, but that's not my field. I mean, I, I'm out there with a hammer and a rucksack collecting rocks. So that's one possible way to, uh, uh, to, to test it, you know, with the molecular, ask a molecular biologist to help out, all right, using modern uh, amobaculites and sculptobaculites. Okay, so there is a question from Arindam, please. Hi, Mike. Uh, a hello, really hello. nice. Yeah, hi. So it's it is really a nice uh, introduction for the forum because I am not a forum expert and I don't work in forums, but it it's really interesting. So I just want to know, like, uh, do a particular species of agglutinated forum have only one type of mineral in it, or it depends on the environment where it stays? Like I want to know this one. Generally, it depends on the environment, but there are some forms that have a preference for certain minerals, certain shapes, certain density of minerals. Um, there's one form that's named after me from the Arabian Gulf, agglutinella kaminskii. And it's, it's an agglutinated milliolid that picks up, it likes to pick up mafic minerals, heavy minerals. All right. Oh. Why it does that? Well, it lives probably in the in the areas that are, you know, of strong currents and shallow water, and it wants to be heavier than the sand in which it lives. So, the some of these foraminifera have a preference for certain grains. But of course, if they don't have them in the environment, then they'll use something else. Okay. So, and the next one is uh, uh, all the agglutinated forums are always attached or it's like a free moving also? There are both. You, you find both attached and free living. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. The next question, ICC. Me? me? I don't, don't, oh, yeah, you, you can say, you can ask a question. Okay, great. That was a super that. interesting talk. Um, oh, really, really enjoyed it. I love really deep time paleo things. Um, I'm a little bit interested kind of in your um, data collection. And I really wanted to know what's the kind of um, forearm density that you're getting in your sediment samples that you're searching in. So you said you're out there with a hammer and you're collecting your samples yourself. How much sediment do you really need to get? to get kind of a full assemblage of what's happening at that time. Uh, yeah, all right, in the Kusaiba and in the Vra'an formation, we would collect about a half a kilo sample mm -hmm. and uh, boil up half of it, right? So out of about 250 grams, you get enough. You, you have a, a, a statistically valid assemblage, 300 to 500 specimens. So cool. it's, it's okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I saw on your graph that the, uh, the uh, the diversity is much lower further back in time. So I'm presuming oh, yeah, yeah. you also yeah. find less individuals per unit of sediment also. Yeah. Okay. Yes, in the Hanadir, the density is a bit lower. Um, at the maximum flooding horizon in Ra'an, you have the highest diversity and the highest number, just at the mm -hmm. maximum flooding surface. So, you know, where you have some condensation of, of the section. A bit higher, it gets silty, so you have fewer. Um, it, it, it depends. It depends on the lithology. Oh, wow. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I'd love to be out of the field taking samples like that with a hammer. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Christopher, it's your turn. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Hi. <laughs> hello, hello. One of the questions I had was about um, the cement. Uh, if you can determine what sort of cement was used in these forums, whether it's purely organic or whether there are signs that there may have been some sort of maybe uh, calcareous uh, addition to the cement or not. All the genera that we have here in the Paleozoic are known from the modern environment, and they are known to have organic cement. Um, the calcareous cemented forms really don't come in until the carboniferous. So um, there's nothing here that secretes calcite or, or, or carbonate. They've all used an organic cement, which is preserved now as silica quartz. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about is that there could be uh, multiple origins for uh, multi-chambered uh, foraminiferous. So I know uh, Pawlowski, I think that's how you say his name. Yeah, Pawlowski. He suggest Pawlowski. He suggested in 2013 that there could be uh, maybe three origins, like Lagunita, Tubothalamea, and then, of course, Globothalamea. Right. So it may be that it may be that uh, you know you're right, but that there are, are multiple origins, and and that's likely. Yeah, that is likely. Um, I have no doubt that the monothalamids were the oldest group, and then the tubothalamids came next. And uh, the question is, where did the globothalamids come from? So probably from an attached tubothalamid. That's my guess. All right, but maybe the molecular biologists can prove me wrong. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Then, Joan? Juan again? Johan. Yeah, Johan, yes. Johan is there. Yeah. Yeah. Schönen guten Abend. Johan, your microphone is mute. I try to, to get it. Okay, no. Still mute. Okay, that's obviously not working. Let's move on. It's working now. Yes. Oh yes. Okay, yes. Now. Okay. So so. Uh, hi, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Johan. Nice to hear <laughs> hello, from you. Mike. So, I I'm not convenient with with with, with the Zoom working. So you didn't get the screen from from me. No, I don't oh, see so. you. I hear you. Yeah. Okay. My question is, you know, uh. uh Pavlovsky and, and uh, Jarek, they have the, wrote uh, the paper about the evolution and the distinction of the foraminiferous the tubu uh, taganids and, and global taganids. So. Hmm. And in your, uh, in your the, the derivation of the far genetic, you get all these forms from tubular forms. But I think there is a strong differentiation between the global talamia and the tubothalamia. And I think also in the originating form, I am thinking that all the global forms don't have any uh, tubular form, as you yeah. suppose. Yeah. Only they're putting only a, a rounded chamber after the other chamber. And the septa uh, uh, are formed by the overlapping of, of, of the following chambers. Of the yeah, that's, that's, that's the point that I wanted to make, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I showed the so you have no, no pseudo scepter, so mm. you have always real scepter. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So what what if you have a an attached single chambered form? Yeah. All right, growing like a hemisphere amina. Yeah, right? yeah. There's one opening. All right. How does yeah, it grow? Yeah, okay, yeah, it yeah. makes a new chamber next to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's the, yeah, big, that's it, the it, origin okay. of the global I think so, But I, I don't think so that it is really necessary you have it from an attached form. I think there should be some free living forms also making such uh, only uh, succession of the chambers, uh, like global, global chambers. I don't know if you need these attached forms as the pre-runners of the chambers. The reason I thought of the, the attachment yeah. is that you have a hemisphere amina sitting on a yeah, yeah. Of light. where does it go if it mm -hmm. wants to build a bigger chamber? Only yeah. next door. Yeah. 
and it links up with the aperture. That becomes then multi-chambered. Yeah. And it's 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 restrained and its movement is limited by the attachment surface. So yeah. it has to build the next chamber next door. Yeah, but uh, I think it could be possible that you have a free living sarasakaman and also the pudding when growing up, not yes. leaving, leaving it, but putting the next chamber directly, yeah. but all free living. A free living sarasakaman could do the same, yeah. 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 So it just builds another bigger chamber attached to the previous chamber. Yeah, and then yes, it yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Of so, course, this is, is, is my opinion that we could be that this is also a tendency to get the multi chambered globular forms. Global I form. think both, both possibilities are, are possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt about that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> See you in Urbino. No. In the Urbino. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, just uh, we have now the question, then we will move on the chat because there are several questions on the chat as well. Vash? Yeah, can you hear me, Mike? Yes. Uh, as you told in uh, some of the conclusions that you have future plans to uh, use them uh, for biostatigraphy. So uh, do they have uh, the short ranges and do you think there is a potential to use them for biostatigraphy? Uh, normally, benthic foraminifera we don't use for they are very long ranging. So, what's your uh, these are experience? probably long. These are probably long ranging, and what appears yeah. to be biostratigraphy in our section could be ecology because it is a shallowing upward sequence. Okay. So the diversity decreases as you go higher. Okay. So it you know that 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 has to be checked. Uh, second question is. Uh, you talked about that pseudo chambered forms. Yeah. So is it that pseudo chambered forms are the plexus between those of single chambered and multi chambered? And there is an attempt to have a pseudo chamber and then evolve into the multi chambered forms. Yes, they are sort of transitional between tubothalamids and globothalamids. But the thing about pseudo chambered form is that the wall between the chambers connects, it's continuous. It's not overlapping, all right? Yeah. It's a continuous wall. So how do we get from this situation where you have a continuous wall between chambers to an overlapping chamber arrangement? That's the big question. How did that happen? Yeah. And my last question is, as you are working with this very old foraminifera, uh, well, uh, do you have some idea as to what would have been the ecological reasons for evolving from a single chamber to multi chambers hmm. What are the ecological reasons? Growth, obviously. Um, when the organism wants to grow, it adds a chamber. So um, unilocular forms probably discard their early chamber when they grow and they build a new one. Okay. So growth is one. It's probably the main reason. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mike, if you look at the chat. The okay, one... let's see if I can find the chat here. Okay, otherwise I just start with the, so there is, a, uh, let's say, Donata Violanti that says, thank you, Mike, extremely interesting. There is Malcolm, that I mm. know, probably it's Malcolm Art. Are you Malcolm? Let's say in graphitolytic shales and mudstone, would there be enough oxygen? That is the thing. Um, many new innovations among foraminifera are found in dysoxic environments. When you have a low oxygen area, you get new and unusual forms. Not only among calcareous planktonics, but among agglutinates as well. And I can give, the, give you the example of, of Cenozoic low oxygen environments that have unusual agglutinated foraminifera with complex inner structure and so forth. So the foraminifera need to evolve new strategies to cope with the low oxygen conditions. And that was the case in the early Paleozoic here. These 
black shales, gray shales, and outcrop um, represent disoxic and even anoxic environments. Okay, then there is uh, uh, Alonso Garcia that says thanks for this very interesting talk. Muhammad Naim Abdubarek, sorry if the pronunciation is not so right. They say interesting knowledge share, thank you, Mike. Then mm. there is Pam. Uh, Pam that say fascinating talk, many thanks. Question What are the actual characteristics of the primitive two chambered forms? What is the difference between constrictions and actual early chamber formation? Right. Uh, probably the most primitive attempt at forming chambers would be if you have a tube and you make constrictions and you make sausages, right, with a continuous wall. So you start with the sausage shaped chambers and then they become more regular, but still a continuous wall. So um, those are the pseudo chambered forms. And yes, there are some agglutinated forms uh, that belong to the hyperamina group, which have a proloculus, and then a second chamber with some constrictions. All right. So that's the first early attempt at forming chambers. And it evolves from there. So although I, I probably, these, those forms with constrictions are still probably belonging to the tubothalamid group rather than to globothalamids. So, okay, then there is Lucilla Capotoni that say many thanks, Mike. Very interesting talk. Then we have Rafa Rafael Morale that say the latest molecular work seems to fall in independent, An independent origin. Yeah, okay. And the global Salamea, and then he gives a, a, a link to a publication. Okay. Thanks for the link. I'll download it and I'll be happy to read it. But yeah, um, even in Cretaceous, we have a pseudo chambered form called Trochaminoides. And if you look very early in the ontogeny, it starts out like Amodiscus, unchambered. And then later, after a few whirls, it acquires the pseudo chambers. All right. So even these forms in the Cretaceous, they are tubothalamids. The, the like the trochaminoides group, um, they start out life unchambered, and then they later require chambers. So yeah, those are two independent group of four aminifera, pseudo chambered and forms with real chambers. Another question. So there is Susan Richardson. Some living species of Iridia frequently attached to sea grasses form interconnected chambers with mm -hmm. but others evacuate their cells and crawl around and crawl around and form a new one. Chamber test. Yeah. How do you grow if you only make one chamber? You abandon the old chamber and you grow a new one. But obviously at some stage, these forms started to attach themselves to the previous chamber as Johann suggested. And then they became multi-chambered. Then yeah. okay. uh, says to remember that some forums are anaerobes and can be even if there is oxygen. Or is no oxygen. Yeah, they can survive anoxia, apparently. Some foraminifera can do that. Um, I believe there was in the upper part of the Kusaiba formation some oxygen because you have thin sandstone beds which are bioturbated. So there was some macrofauna. It was low oxygen, but there must have been some oxygen. So I don't know whether uh, our early Paleozoic agglutinates were uh, adapted to life in anoxic conditions. Suboxic, yes. And again, Malcolm, the results of the case in many Caucasians always where we find some very odd agglutinated taxa. That's exactly when the foraminifera evolve when you have the anoxic events. I'm convinced of it. And then Arindam 
Uh, is there any particular environmental reason if the fossil environment has an abundance of acetylated forum in respect to the calcareous form? Yeah, well, if you, if you move up to the Paleogene or the uh, Cretaceous, um, where we have both agglutinated and calcareous, uh, it's obvious that the agglutinated forms uh, live beneath the calcium carbonate compensation depth. So they're inhabiting the abyssal areas of the oceans. They are found in low oxygen environments, all right, which have some uh, reducing, like at the bottom of the oxygen minimum zone. Uh, that tends to be a, another good place for agglutinates. And in the marshes and mangroves, which have this toxic mud, uh, you know, full of hydrogen sulfide, uh, and the calcareous forms just don't survive there. Uh, the agglutinates, the trochaminids, and live in such extreme environments. And uh, someone even reported them living close to hydrothermal vents on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. So areas and places that are uh, hazardous to uh, calcium carbonate producing organisms, um, they're okay with, the agglutinates are okay because they don't synthesize carbonate. Okay, then we have free at the moment with the data basically congratulations. So Nisha says nice knowledge sharing. Thank you, Mike. Muhammad Danif says very nice talk. Came across some new stuff regarding Paleozoic agglutinate forum. Alex Forbisto says grazie mille Mike. Very grazie good. mille. Yeah. <laughs> Con piacere. Yes, Leon Rodriguez that say I would have to argue this agglutinated forum Love silty and clay environments near muddy turbidic flows. Yeah, yeah, sure. If you go to uh, Poland or the Czech Republic and go to the deep water clastic deposits, you have only glutinated foraminifera from the Cretaceous to the Miocene. All right. So the, 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 the turbidite environments, uh, or that's one environment that favors the agglutinated forms. That is true. They love the silty and clay environments near muddy turbididic flows. Yes, yeah, I agree with that. Okay, and the sad thing. Okay, uh, there are no other messages in the chat. No, there is Mike Bigfoot. Very good, thing, Mike. May, thank you very much and enjoy the celebration in PSA tonight. What what is going to happen tonight? In a half an hour. Yeah. Polska is playing Mexico. Oh, I see. Sorry. So, you know, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm not really uh, interested in, in, in football. So sorry. <laughs> okay. yeah. And we have a big screen up in our square in the middle of the campus uh, next to our student mall, you know, the student center. So everybody is going there to watch the game. <laughs> have a nice evening, what I can say. So if there are no other questions, and um, message in the chat. So, I so I'll just sign off by saying that if you have an interest in agglutinated foraminifera, you know that um, before the EGU meeting next uh, spring, we have a agglutinated workshop. It will be held in Krakow. I believe the dates are the 20th to the 23rd. Um, so it's the weekend before the EGU meeting in Vienna. And for those who want to go to both meetings, there's a night train from Krakow to Vienna. That's the train I always take. And we would like to welcome you to Krakow to the 11th workshop on agglutinated foraminifera. If you're interested, send me a message, let us know. You're welcome to join us. That's wonderful, great. Thank you very much, Mike. We Thanks, Maria Rose. I'll, I'll see you hopefully, you know, at the meeting in the springtime. Oh, yes.